Section 40 of The Catholic's Ready Answer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Michael, Sussex, Wisconsin, USA. The Catholic's Ready Answer by Rev. M. P. Hill, Section 40. Free Love. A Socialist Plea. The only true marriage is a marriage founded in love. When love ceases, it is immoral for the parties to remain united. Marriage is a private compact in which no one but the married couple should have any say. The Answer Such is the socialist idea of marriage as defended by Bebel. How the leaders of socialism can presume to describe any act as either moral or immoral is beyond our comprehension. Socialist leaders are atheists and materialists. See Socialism 2, 3, and 4. And being such, they have no basis for their so-called morality. But we can let that pass. It is convenient for socialists to use a respectable old term with a new meaning. Socialists affect to regard as calumny the accusation that they wish to abolish marriage. But here, again, they are using an old word in a new meaning. In all civilized countries, the word marriage has conveyed the idea of a permanent union between man and wife. Even the non-Catholic sects that permit divorce on account of grave sin regard marriage as permanent in the intention of the parties before the contract is made. Till death do us part is the phrase used at the marriage ceremony. Socialists may apply the term to the transient and evanescent thing which they are fain to establish in the place of genuine marriage, but they cannot expect us to follow suit. It is plain from the objection placed at the top of the page that a socialist marriage and a Christian marriage have little in common and are in many points opposed. Christian marriage is permanent. A socialistic marriage may be dissolved when love has vanished. Christian marriage is a divine institution, the conditions of which are fixed by divine law. Socialistic marriage is subject to the arbitrary control of man. In Christian marriage, the wife is subject to the husband. Ephesians verse 22. In the above objection, the independence of the wife is implied. The genuine Christian idea of marriage makes it one of the seven sacraments of the church, and thus places it under the church's jurisdiction. Socialism makes it a private affair in which no one is allowed to interfere. The dominance of socialism would, therefore, mean the destruction of Christian marriage, and with all the destruction of the Christian family. All family would, indeed, be more than imperiled. But the evil would not end here. Marriage under socialism would be nothing short of the reign of free love, with little or no restraint placed upon its tyranny. In the first place, under socialism, marriage, being a purely private affair, would have no legal status. It would be wholly dependent on the caprice of human passion, and human passion would feel itself free to go foraging wherever it pleased. There would be no force of public opinion or public sense of decency to keep it within bounds. On the contrary, public opinion would encourage a change of partners when affection had changed. No effectual obstacle, in a word, could be interposed to prevent love from seeking and finding its object. If this is not free love, differing but little from the promiscuous pairing of birds and beasts, the term has no meaning. Even if a socialist marriage had a certain legal status and the marital union, as long as it lasted, were protected from invasion by a third party, nonetheless the way would be thrown upon to an invader through the affections, which would reign supreme in all such matters in the socialist commonwealth. Imagine a concrete case. Tom and Lizzie have taken a fancy to each other. It is only a fancy, but that doesn't matter. They are socialists and are willing to try their chances, and straight away they join hands in wedlock, agreeing to remain together as long as they like one another. A month or two later, 
Lizzie meets with a pair of eyes more attractive than Tom's, and her liking for Tom begins to wane. But Tom's liking for Lizzie remains unchanged. When the crisis comes, he pleads his heartfelt affection and argues against a separation. But the matter is soon arranged. They are both true socialists, and they part in the true socialistic spirit. Lizzie, meantime, has felt small commiseration for Tom, as he knows he will soon be within reach of recovered happiness. Is society willing to inaugurate this state of things? We think not. Certainly, if it once had a taste of it, it would soon rebound from the tyranny of free and untrammeled sensual passion. It is not a question of free love among angels, but of free love among human beings possessed of strong animal instincts, the unrestrained indulgence of which would sink man to the level of the brute. The principle that marriage should cease when love ceases is unfortunately held by many who are not socialists, and, indeed, for one who has lost sight of the divine origin of marriage, and who is at the same time capable of seeing only one aspect of a situation, it may be quite natural to advocate the separation of man and wife when mutual affection is ceased, and the seeking of marital happiness by either of the parties through a second alliance. But one does not need to be much of a social philosopher to see the evil effects that would be wrought upon society by making the permanence of marriage depend upon the vagaries of human affection. To see, among other things, how the family would be destroyed, how offspring would suffer, how populations would diminish, and how all the nobler aims and activities of life would be paralyzed. The perfection of marriage does, it is true, depend on the perfection of love, and conjugal love, under obedience to divine law and under the best Christian influences, is made as perfect as anything can be made in this life. And even where love has cooled, Conjugal amity can, by the aid of sacramental grace, be preserved. Where much suffering is endured by one of the parties in consequence of the guilty acts of the other, both human and divine law has provided for separation, whilst the best interests of society, as well as of the individuals concerned, forbid the complete severance of the bond of matrimony. Even those who are beyond the reach of sacramental grace can, by the aid of the ordinary graces, vouchsafed to all classes of men overcome the difficulties incident to the married state, especially if they live according to their lights and observe the natural law. End of section 40